Greetings, folks, and welcome back to the Monster Raving Looney Party's campaign rally. Those of you who are in the know may know that elections were held in the United Kingdom earlier this month. Perhaps you also know the result of these elections. They flipped British politics on its head. Put simply, the ruling Conservative Party was annihilated, losing 244 seats and suffering a vote split between them and Nigel Farage's Reform UK Party, which came in third in the popular vote and won five seats. Similarly, the Scottish National Party lost over 80% of their seats, all in Scotland. Alongside Reform UK, the two parties that handily won the night were the Liberal Democrats and, more namely, Labour. The Labour Party, led by Sir Keir Starmer, now the Prime Minister, now controls a 411-seat majority, just seven seats behind Tony Blair's famous landslide in 1997. To further express just how badly the Tories were crushed, numerous government officials and presumptive successors to party leader Rishi Sunak lost their seats. The most notable figure to lose her seat was former Prime Minister Minister Liz Truss, who lost her seat of Southwest Norfolk to Terry Jeremy, the Labour candidate, by a mere 630 votes. However, there was a concern expressed in private by then Prime Minister Sunak that he would lose his own seat of Richmond and North Allerton in the election. Sunak was one of the 13 candidates vying for the seat, the most in the entire country. However, the seat's similarly shaped predecessor was the safest seat for the Tories in 2001, back when it was held by the then leader of the opposition, William Hague. Ultimately, Sunak held on to the seat with a 47.5% plurality. So, why did I mention all of this? Well, nowadays, most of the legislative bodies for the countries of the world have a singular leader, usually chosen from within the legislature. Many times, that leader is also the leader of their political party within the legislature, meaning they are often the face associated with that party when election day rolls around. Similarly, disastrous electoral landslides are not uncommon occurrences, and many times the party's leader resigns, often in disgrace, after the elections. But there is one major way in which leading a party into a staggering defeat can be even more embarrassing, losing your own seat in the election. See, party leaders are usually chosen from seats that are at least reliable holds in an election. Oftentimes, the leader's seat is a very safe seat. Sunak's seat is a very safe seat for the Tories and is very unlikely to vote otherwise. In the United States, House Speaker Mike Johnson's district in Louisiana is a very Republican seat. Johnson was re-elected unopposed in 2022 and is running unopposed once again. But I digress. While parties may try to pick leaders from safe seats, they don't get it right all the time, and upsets can happen. The nature of the populace is seldom predictable. That is what this video is about. In this video, we're going to take a look at those times when the leader of a legislative body loses their own seat in an election, often accompanied by a colossal defeat for the party as a whole. Aside from an allegation of depravity or corruption, it is often the most disgraced a politician can get. They organized the party's march into slaughter, and they fell from the platform from which they directed said march. But enough poetic shies. Let's get started. Arguably one of the most famous examples of this phenomenon occurred on the 25th of October, 1993, in Canada. But first, we must jump back nine years. In 1984, the Progressive Conservative Party, under the leadership of 45-year-old Brian Mulroney, won a landslide victory against the governing Liberal Party, and the PCs, as I'll refer to them for the rest of this section, came to dominate the Canadian Parliament for three consecutive governments. While he remained a popular figure throughout the 80s, an economic recession in the early 90s and the rise of the right-wing Populist Reform Party caused Mulroney's popularity to plummet. He resigned as Prime Minister on June 25th, 1993. His successor was a member of a second government representing part of Vancouver, Kim Campbell. To date, Campbell is the only Canadian Prime Minister from British Columbia and the only woman to have served the mandate. It was under Campbell that the election would be called, and the PCs hoped a new Prime Minister at the helm would provide enough momentum to hold on the power. However, general dissatisfaction with PC as a whole and many of the party's voters flocking to reform caused the Liberal Party, under the leadership of one Jean Chrétien, overtook them in the polls. Despite that, when it came to Kim Campbell as a person, she was the candidate people most wanted as Prime Minister, leading Chrétien by 13 points. However, it wouldn't matter how much voters wanted her, for the fate of the election would pretty much be sealed with just 11 days to go. This is this a Prime Minister? Does he understand that his plan to allow a deficit each year would increase our debt? How can he believe that you can kickstart a modern economy by fixing some roads. Why doesn't he answer the questions he's asked? Doesn't he understand the questions? Or the answers? Or both? Jean Chrétien, a prime minister? Think twice. 
Many people point to the ad you just watched as the main reason for the results of the election. Critics from both within the party and without criticized the ad for what seemed to be a mockery of Christiane's physical deformity. Christiane was born with Bell's palsy and is only able to speak out of one side of his mouth. PCs across the country issued apologies, including Campbell, who reportedly had never seen the ad prior to its airing. Campbell and the other leading PCs then attempted to quench the flames, claiming the ad was not meant to insult Christiane, but rather question his ability to lead Canada. Voters weren't buying it, and the Progressive Conservative Party was essentially wiped off the map on election day. Their 156-seat majority had been reduced to a mere two seats, one in Quebec and another in New Brunswick. Losing almost 99% of their seats put the party in fifth place, with reform taking a narrow third. As can be expected, Prime Minister Campbell was one of the many incumbents defeated that day. She would never serve an elected office again. One thing I should note is that Campbell's seat, Vancouver Center, was not a safe seat by any means. In 1988, she was elected to Parliament by a mere 269 votes. In 1993, she lost the seat to the Liberal candidate, Hetty Fry, by a margin of almost 6%, translating to a little under 4,000 votes. As the 1990s progressed, both Reform and PC lost steam, and by the millennium shift, both parties were essentially dead. In 2003, a new unified party arose from their ashes, the Conservative Party. It has since only had one Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, and is the leading opposition party today. Though the United States doesn't have a parliamentary system, it mimics it a lot. Both houses of Congress have a majority and minority leader, chosen by their respective parties. In the House of Representatives, the Speaker is a much more active leader and functions a lot like a Prime Minister. The Speaker is elected by all incumbent representatives immediately prior to them being sworn in. The key takeaway is that the Speaker and majority minority leaders of both houses are almost always sitting members of said house. With that in mind, let's now set the stage for our next case. The year is 1994. The nation is preparing for her midterm elections to be held on Tuesday, November 8th. During midterms, named as such for occurring in the middle of a president's term, one-third of the seats in the Senate and the entirety of the House of Representatives go up for election. A number of governor's seats also go up for election. In 1994, the elections were being held during Democrat Bill Clinton's first term, and the Republican Party had been flung into a rage by some of his decisions and policies, particularly his failed health care plan. Furthermore, frustrations over a deficit spending were widespread. The last time the budget was in a surplus, which is when the government makes more money than it spends, was in the early 1950s. The Republican platform of 1994 pushed for a number of major pieces of legislation, the most significant of which being a balanced budget amendment. Known as the Contract with America, the platform helped the party sweep the elections. The Republicans won back both houses of Congress, flipping 10 governorships, 8 Senate seats, and 54 House seats, taking control of the House for the first time since the 1952 elections. Nowadays, it is referred to as the Republican Revolution. Among the highest profile defeats of the night were three-term New York Governor Mario Cuomo and one-term Texas Governor Ann Richards. However, another major profile loss occurred in the House, and it seems to have been forgotten today. Thomas Stephen Foley was elected to the House of Representatives in 1964, defeating Republican incumbent Walt Horan to represent Washington's 5th District, which includes the city of Spokane. Despite Foley not being the most conservative of Democrats, the district consistently voted for Republican candidates in presidential elections. Foley generally won re-election by comfortable margins, and on June 6, 1989, he was elected Speaker of the House. Speaker Foley presided over three Congresses and in 1994 was running for re-election to a 16th term, having served for almost 30 years. His opponent was Republican George Nethercutt, a lawyer similarly based out of Spokane. One of the main issues in the local campaign was term limits. Foley had gained notoriety in Washington State for his virulent opposition to term limits, further noted by his run for a 16th term. Nethercutt hammered the issue in Foley, and it greatly hurt his campaign. On election day, Nethercutt defeated Foley by a narrow margin of about 4,000 votes. <laughs> Deja vu. Foley became the first incumbent Speaker of the House to lose re-election since Galusha Grow in 1862. He was succeeded by Georgia Representative Newt Gingrich, the leading author of the Contract with America. Foley was one of a handful of leading Democratic congressmen to lose re-election, but isn't as notable of a casualty of the revolution. Instead, most people would think of the defeats of Governors Cuomo and Richards. Tom Foley would never run for elected office again, and died at the age of 84 in 2013. George Nethercutt went on to serve five terms 
in the House, despite promising to serve only three when campaigning against Speaker Foley, and died just last month. In an ironic twist of fate, President Clinton's second term and the first year George W. Bush's presidency would be the most recent time the federal budget produced a surplus. And as for that balanced budget amendment, it passed the House after being introduced the day after the 104th United States Congress was sworn in, but it came up one vote short of the two-thirds majority in the Senate. The decisive vote came from a Republican senator from Oregon named Mark Hatfield. Since then, the idea of a balanced budget amendment has persisted, but it hasn't had quite the traction it had in 1995. While the Senate Majority Leader is as major of a role as Speaker of the House, instead being superseded by the Senate President and President Pro Tempe, they do, in a way, represent their party as a whole for Senate elections. With that in mind, let's go back to 1952. The year was much more notable for its presidential election, held between Republican Dwight D. Eisenhower and Democrat Adlai Stevenson II. However, this year would also see a much more lowbrow election in the Senate, the result of which is our next example. Ernest William McFarland, a Democrat, served in minor naval and judicial roles prior to his election as Arizona's junior senator in 1940. In that race, he first primaried incumbent Senator Henry F. Ashurst, one of Arizona's first two senators. He then won the general election in a landslide. One of his big campaign concerns in Arizona was on water laws and appealed to the federal government for increased allocation of water to Arizona. In 1951, McFarland was chosen by the Democrats to be Senate Majority Leader. He was chosen mainly because the other contenders for the role lost their seats in the 1950 elections. In 1952, McFarland would face the same fate. McFarland Farland ran for re-election to a third term and faced one of Arizona's leading Republicans, a member of the Phoenix City Council by the name of Barry Morris Goldwater. Goldwater had previously played a key role in the election of fellow Republican John Howard Pyle as governor. Goldwater, after deciding to run for McFarland's seat, allegedly placed his odds of winning at 15 to 1. Goldwater employed a get-out-the-vote strategy in his campaign, while McFarland was, in Goldwater's words, carrying the weight of Truman's mistakes around his neck. When November 4th arrived, Goldwater defeated McFarland by a narrow margin margin of 6,279 votes. In the presidential race, Eisenhower handily defeated Stevenson, greatly outperforming Goldwater in Arizona. Ultimately, McFarland wouldn't have gotten another term as majority leader anyway, as the Republicans won both houses of Congress. Instead, famed Ohio Senator Robert Taft was chosen by the Republicans as the majority leader. The Republicans' congressional victories have been attributed to a coattail effect caused by Eisenhower's victory in the presidential race. President-elect Eisenhower was the first Republican to win a presidential election since 1928. Ernest McFarland actually remained in politics following his Senate defeat. In 1954, he defeated Governor Pyle to become the 10th governor of Arizona. He was re-elected in 1956 in a landslide. In 1958, he challenged Senator Goldwater for his old Senate seat. However, Goldwater easily whooped them by a margin of 12%. Governor McFarland then went on to serve in the Arizona Supreme Court, even as Chief Justice in 1968, and died in 1984. As for Goldwater, he rather famously received the Republican nomination for the presidency in 1964, losing the president Lyndon B. Johnson in a landslide. He would be elected to the Senate again in 1968 and served until his retirement in 1987. He died in 1998. Partially thanks to Goldwater, the Republican Party would dominate Arizona for the next 60 years. From 1953 to 2020, the Republicans held at least one of Arizona's Senate seats, and Arizona only voted Democrat in the presidential level twice in that time frame. Pre-20th century parliamentary elections were anything but clean-cut and orderly. MPs were much more dynamic with party ties than they are nowadays. They could be elected on a joint ticket or on a cross-endorsement. Sometimes they'd be elected weeks or years after a parliament officially opened, and their chances of dying in office were far higher due to poor medical technology. There are also cases of an MP belonging to one party but consistently voting against it, and official party leaders weren't set in stone ideas yet. And if there were party leaders, they usually weren't the prime minister or leader of the opposition at the same time. While parliamentary elections had mostly solidified their systems into today's prim and proper molds by the early 20th century, there was one major holdout nation, one with poor records and a famously unstable system, in which all of what I described a minute ago took place. The nation in question, often forgotten as having a legislative body, is the Russian Empire. In 1905, caused by centuries of absolute Tsarist rule and Russia's loss against Japan in the Russo-Japanese War, a revolution sprang up across Russia. In order to bring it to an end and appease the modern revolutionaries, 
case, Tsar Nikolai II issued the October Manifesto, which, among other things, called for the establishment of a legislative body known as the Imperial State Duma. Suffrage was limited, and a number of safeguards were put in place by the Tsar to maintain his control over it. Despite that, parties across the political spectrum were set up, and there was a sense of enthusiasm among the voting public. The first elections were scheduled for early 1906. The reason I can't give an exact date is another fault of these antiquated parliamentary systems. Elections were held over the span of numerous months. For example, the 1906 elections were held at different dates across the empire, spanning from late February to as late as June. Ultimately, there were four Dumas, though one Duma's term was supposed to be five years. The first two Dumas only lasted a few months, however, as they were dissolved by imperial decree when they angered the Tsar. The third state Duma, which opened in November 1907, would be the first one to hold out and complete that five-year term, and here is where this story begins. Alexander Ivanovich Gushkov was leader of the Union of October 17th, known in short as the Octoberists, which supported the October Manifesto but opposed any further reform or limitation to the Tsar's power. He was elected to the Third State Duma, in which the Octoberists were the largest party. The Octoberists initially supported the reforms instituted by Prime Minister Pyotr Stolypin, but the two grew at odds with each other as the years went on. By the 1910s, there was a growing discontent among Octoberists, as many felt the provisions of the October Manifesto hadn't been implemented or were being subverted. While the mainstream when the party drifted leftward, a movement of right-wing dissent emerged from within, led by Yakov Gololobov. These dissenters eventually left the party and formed a new one, known as the Center. This caused Guchkov to become chairman of the State Duma on the 10th of March, 1910. Then, a government crisis over a bill regarding the expansion of local assemblies to western provinces caused Guchkov to resign from the post on March 15, 1911. The rest of the party began to tear itself apart, rifting into two internal factions. The left wing of the party became known as the Duma Group Octoberists, while the remaining of the right wing and party center became known as the Ziemsvo Octoberists. The third state Duma's term ended on June 8, 1912, and elections were held later that year, over the months of September and October. The election results were technically a win for the Octoberists, who clung on to 99 seats. However, because of the factionalist split, 65 of those seats were won by Ziemsvo Octoberists, while 22 of those seats were won by Duma Group Octoberists. The other 12 seats were associates or quote unquote non party deputies. In effect, this means that a loose coalition of national Nationalist figures and parties were the true winners of the elections, securing 88 seats. In his constituency of Moscow, Gushkov lost his bid for re-election. We don't know how many votes he got. Who defeated him, however, is debatable, and there aren't all that many good sources on the matter. See, Russia used a list system, meaning constituencies were often entire governorates, and parties would put up lists of candidates for each constituency. The number of votes the party got would determine how many candidates from that list were elected. Based on that, from my research, it seems that Gushkov was defeated, or rather, replaced by Mikhail Novikov, a member of the Constitutional Democratic Party, which was a constitutional monarchist party slightly more to the left of the Octoberists. Unfortunately, the Russian government didn't keep the greatest of records for the times, so it may be a case of God only knows. Though Guchkov was no longer a member of the Duma, he would remain a major figure in Russian politics. He was on the royal train with Tsar Nikolai II when he signed the Instrument of Abdication in the wake of the February Revolution and served in the first provisional government as the Minister of War, a position he served for only two months in the spring of 1970. After the October Revolution, Guchkov fled to Germany. In Berlin, he was beaten up by a far-right Russian exile in 1923. He lived the rest of his life in relative obscurity and died in Paris on February 14, 1936. While he wasn't technically the Duma speaker at the time of his defeat, he was still the leader of the largest party in the Duma when he lost his seat. The next example is, on its own, an innocuous election. There wasn't any major scandal, government crisis, opposition campaign, or serious event that radically affected the eventual outcome of this election. The only thing that makes election really stand out in this day and age is the fact that a prime minister lost his seat. John Winston Howard began his career as a lawyer and the president of the Young Liberals, the youth wing of the center-right Liberal Party of Australia, perpetually in a coalition with the National Party of Australia. After narrowly losing an election to the New South Wales Legislative Assembly in 1968, he was was elected to the Australian House of Representatives for the seat of Benelong in 1974. He was first chosen to be the leader of the Liberal Party and subsequently the leader of the opposition in 1985, but he was removed from the post four years later. He was re-elected the party's leader in 1995 and led the Liberal National Coalition to a landslide victory in 1996, ousting Labour Prime Minister Paul Keating. Now the Prime Minister, Howard's government brought Australia into the 21st century, presiding over a period of economic growth and committing Australian support to America's wars in Afghanistan and Iraq 
back following 9-11. Having won four elections in a row, Prime Minister Howard called for another election to be held on November 24, 2007. The Labour Party, now led by opposition leader Kevin Rudd, sought to return to power for the first time in 11 years. The election campaign was pretty normal. The main issues were health insurance, interest rates, climate policy, and the controversial work choices reforms. The coalition trailed Labour in the polls for the whole of the campaign, and when the results came in, Labour had defeated the coalition in a landslide, flipping 23 seats and narrowly winning the popular vote. Despite that, the coalition gained ground in Western Australia, net gaining one seat. I know these numbers sound small, but Australia's parliament only has 226 seats in total, and only 190 of them were up for election in 2007. However, another curious predicament had occurred. When the election was first called, Ben Long was still in contention. It seemed to many that Prime Minister Howard had lost his seat. In his concession speech to Kevin Rudd, he expressed a concern that he, quote, may have lost his seat. My friends, um, although it is still uh, officially in doubt, it, it, it is very likely to be the case that I will no longer be the member for Benelong. No! Mm. As it turned out, he had indeed lost Benelong. The Labour candidate, Maxine McHugh, had defeated Howard by a narrow margin of a couple thousand votes. With that defeat, his 33 years in Parliament had come to an end, and he retired from politics soon after. Perhaps the writing on the wall was present for a few years prior to his defeat. His margins of victory in the seat were generally double digits, often around 20 points. However, in the 2000s, his margin of victory narrowed quite rapidly. In 2001, he won the seat by a margin of 15 points. In 2004, the margin was only 9. Regardless, Rudd became Prime Minister with a new Labour majority government to boot. Rudd's actions included signing the Kyoto Protocol, withdrawing Australian troops from Iraq, and reversing work choices. In an ironic twist of fate, McHugh went on to lose her seat to a coalition candidate in the very next election, held three years later. In case you're wondering, the margin of victory was about 7 points. Our last section is a much more contemporary example than any of the previous five, and is a much more local example, though it takes place in the United States. Stephen M. Sweeney was a labor leader and Democrat from New Jersey. In 2001, he was elected to the New Jersey State Senate for the 3rd District, and would consistently be re-elected by comfortable margins. On the 12th of January 2010, Sweeney became the Senate President. Having been chosen by his party a couple months prior, Sweeney would ultimately go on to be the longest-serving Senate President, garnering quite the reputation for his readiness to work with the opposition. In 2021, New Jersey held elections for its governor and legislature. The governor's race was contested between incumbent Democrat Phil Murphy and Republican Jack Chitterelli. Sweeney ran for re-election. His challenger was Republican Edward Durr, a truck driver for Ray Moore and Flanagan. In the campaign, Sweeney spent about $305,000, while Durr spent, at most, a measly $2,300. Of those that made seat predictions, Sweeney's re-election was predicted as likely. Governor Murphy was also polling at almost double digits over Chitterelli. It seemed like it would be a Democrat sweep in New Jersey as it had been for years. On November 2nd arrived, Murphy did indeed win re-election. However, the margin was significantly closer than expected at 3.2%. Perhaps Chitterelli caused a miniature coattail effect statewide because something else shocking happened in Senate District 3. Edward Durr had defeated Stephen Sweeney. The win was a massive upset and the media had a field day pointing out how the Senate president had lost to a measly truck driver. Even more embarrassing was that the Democrats retained control of the state Senate, although the Republicans net gained a seat. Durr's margin of victory was wider than Murphy's, 3.4. Senator Durr would only serve a single term. In 2023, he was defeated for re-election by former Assemblyman John Berzicelli. The margin was much wider than 2021's, 7.2%. Because Governor Murphy is term limited, the 2025 gubernatorial election is an open seat. Both Sweeney and Durr have declared themselves candidates alongside Jack Chitterelli. With all that said, I'd like to quickly rank these six individuals in terms of how embarrassing the defeat was. In sixth place is Alexander Guchkov. Because Russia kept poor records and used the list system for their elections at the time, his defeat was, if anything, anticlimactic, and more the fault of the quickly collapsing party. The defeat also seemed to have little effect on his influence in Russian politics. In fifth place is Tom Foley. Foley is often forgotten as a casualty of the Republican Revolution, and, well, he honestly had it coming. Nethercutt had a free trump card in the former term limits with which to defeat the 15-term representative in a mostly Republican part of Washington state. In fourth place is John 
on Howard. Howard's seat was getting more competitive in the 2000s, and he seemed prepared to lose as the election results came out. Also note that Howard had been in office for 33 years, and having the same representative for that long can sometimes wear out a voter base. In third place is Ernest McFarland. While he wasn't a major figure nationwide when he lost, his defeat was certainly a massive blow to Arizona Democrats. Take note as well that he'd won his previous two elections in landslides, with margins comparable to that of certain southeastern states. In second place is Kim Campbell. Campbell was given the reins of a party destined for disaster, and while she improved their image somewhat at first, she ultimately failed to lead the party out of a wipeout. Also note that, excluding Gushkov because we don't know his numbers, Campbell is the only one of the other five to lose her seat by a quote-unquote comfortable margin at about 6%. All others lost their seats by at most 5%. And at number one is Stephen Sweeney. As an incumbent, his worst re-election performances were still in high single-digit margins, and he was a major figure in New Jersey politics. Despite all that, he lost to a random truck driver that barely spent anything in his campaign, all while his party won statewide and kept control of the legislature. In a way, that's the most embarrassing. Losing your own seat all while your party wins. But... Okay, let's pour this bad boy. In conclusion, representative systems of government can often produce peculiar results. It's a humorous phenomenon when the sitting leader loses their own bid for re-election, whether or not the party suffers a defeat. But with that said, let me know your thoughts in the comments. Remember to video the like and subscribe the hit button and whatever. Perhaps if this video does well enough, I'll make a part two. We shall see. And remember, drink your water and stop falling over.